It's now my honor to introduce our commencement day speaker, the founder of the online education phenomenon known as the Khan Academy, Sal Khan. Sal earned three degrees from MIT, a bachelor's in mathematics, as well as a bachelor's and master's degree in electrical engineering and computer science, rounding out his education with an MBA from Harvard. Sal began his career as a hedge fund analyst. Within a few years, however, he discovered, quite by accident, what has become his calling. Through preparing video tutorials to help his young cousin learn math, he came to understand both his own gifts as a teacher and a great gift that he could give to the world by creating an online library of thousands of free, bite-sized videos that would shed light on any topic he chose, from geometry to the GDP. Today, the Khan Academy channel on your YouTube has more than 330,000 subscribers and has delivered more than 156 million lessons and has, for millions of students, replaced bafflement with understanding. For launching this revolutionary experiment in online learning in the year 2012, Time Magazine named Sal Khan as one of the 100 most influential people on the planet. This is not the first time that Sal has spoken from the commencement stage here in Killian Court, because he also served as president of his class. In 1998, addressing his fellow graduates, Sal said, and I quote, it is no exaggeration to say that we will change the world. End quote. Having checked this assignment off his to-do list, he joins us here today. Ladies and gentlemen, Sal Khan. No, this, this is really a, a, a surreal, uh, a, a deep honor to, to be here for, for a whole set of reasons. And as was introduced, obviously MIT has played a, a big role in my own life, uh, but I think a, a much deeper role than, than many of y'all might appreciate. Uh, you, you, some of you might remember in the late 90s, kind of when the first internet boom was happening, there was a lot of talk about, about online education. And most of the conversation back then about online education actually not too different than now was around uh, how, how to profit off of it, how to make money off of it, or some institutions were thinking about how to defend against it, or, or at least kind of sit on the sidelines and, and see how all, everything played out. And, and all of a sudden, MIT jumped into the mix, 2001, and announced MIT OpenCourseWare, that it was going to take knowledge and resources that used to be behind the, the walls of elite uni institutions and not charge for them, but, but give them away for free to the world. And, Instead of saying, how can we profit off of this, MIT said, well, there are some things that are higher than that. There are some things that if we could, if we could empower an unlimited number of people, for, for all of time maybe, that's something that we would be willing to spend resources on. And when that happened, you know, I was, I was just a, uh, a couple of years out of college working at a tech company in San Francisco. I had no idea that my own career adventure would lead to, to what I'm doing now. But when I read that press release, I had never been so inspired. I had never felt so proud to come from, from this community. And frankly, a couple of years later when the videos that I had made for my cousins, it became clear that people who, who whom were not my cousins started watching, there, there, there was talk of, well, this could be a business. I was in Silicon Valley. This is what it was all about. I worked for a hedge fund, a, a very uh, for-profit organization. And, and, but it was the memory of, of how I felt the first time I read that press release about OpenCourseWare and what OpenCourseWare had become that really gave me, the, 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 frankly, the clarity to, to understand what Khan Academy could be, that it could be this institution that could reach everyone and that should transcend ideas of, of profits and, and businesses. And I say this not just to show the connection that it had for Khan Academy, but there's, a, there's kind of a meta-level idea here that these days you hear a lot of universities and institutions talk about teaching ethics, teaching morality, instilling that when they'll, they'll take classes on it and tell you to read about it. But MIT actually did it. MIT actually lived by its actions. It actually put, it actually put principle over profit. 
And it's continuing to do it. Now with MITx, now edX, in, in, in concert with Harvard, it's continuing to push the envelope. And I'm just, I'm just in awe of, of, it feels like we're living in a science fiction book of what might happen in, in education in, in, in the next few years. But my connections to MIT go even deeper than that. Obviously, I went here, but my wife also graduated from MIT, class of 2001. The president of Khan Academy and chief operating officer, he was my roommate freshman year at Next House. That's room 343 for the two or three of you who might have shared that room at some point. The, one of our board members went to MIT. His wife went to MIT. And so we, and that's, I'm just starting, that's, that's just a small sample of all of the, the people we know at MIT, but maybe even more surprisingly, the fact that of the people we know from MIT now, 90% of them are married to each other. <laughs> and anytime you have you, this type of love come from one place, I think one should introspect, as romantic as the infinite corridor may be. And, uh, you know, I, I, I've seen such extreme coupling here that, that I've, I've often suspected that this whole place might just be a front for a, a, some type of DARPA-funded breeding project. <laughs> Someone knows what's going on up here. It's, it's, it's a... But there are, there are simpler explanations, and I think the most obvious one, uh, and at least the, the most clear to me, is that the admissions office here at, at both the undergraduate and graduate level uh, seems to have a, a somewhat unhealthy bias for only admitting extremely attractive people. Yes. You're welcome. Yes. <laughs> Thought that would go over well. The, uh, but I think it goes even deeper than that. As long as I can remember to anyone who, who listened to me, I've told people that MIT is the closest thing on this planet Earth to Hogwarts, to, to Harry Potter's wizarding school that the, the, the ideas and the research and the science that percolates behind these walls, that's the closest thing to magic in the real world. And frankly, to people outside of this campus, looks like magic. The faculty we have here, these are the leading wizards of our time. <laughs> the Dumbledores. <laughs> the Dumbledores and McGonagall's. And I guess, President Hockfield, you would be McGonagall. The, uh, the, the, the halls here, they have secret passages and tunnels, and around every corner there are strange and bizarre magical objects and creatures, s s some of whom may finish their thesis this decade. <laughs> Maybe a few in the audience. The, the, when, when we're in Killian Court, it's, it's almost a shrine when you look at the names around us. You see Newton and Darwin and, and Galileo and, 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 and Archimedes. And these are the, the great wizards of history. And, and they remind us that we have inherited uh, an ancient tradition, an ancient art, one that for much of history, and even now today to some degree, has always been sometimes vilified or suppressed by forces of ignorance, but despite that, has always shown through and has been, at least in my mind, the prime cause of, of, of human advancement. The people who come here, the students who come here, you, there are these people, all, these young people all over the world from every walk of life who are all off the charts in some special way for this kind of magic that goes on here. And some come from affluent, rich, educated families. Some, some of you come from poor families where you're the first to get a college degree. Some come from environments where their gifts were really celebrated. Uh, some come from environments where, frankly, most of their life they had to hide their, their passions, their gifts, for, for fear of looking different. But they come here suspecting that this might be a place where they can spread their wings. Where they, can, where they can explore the world, they can finally look with clarity at the mysteries of the universe, the magic of everything that surrounds us. And MIT, I think, delivers on that. It opens our minds to, to what's possible, and, and, and even more uniquely, it pushes us. And I, and I do believe that MIT pushes us harder than probably any other institution in the world. But when you do that, you take someone to another level. You take them truly to recognize what they're capable of. And I think that there's another side effect going to why there's so much love here. When you have people with, regardless of what they look like superficially or where they come from or what type of uh, a background they come from, but they all have that same core desire to understand the universe. They all have that same core desire to push humanity forward. And you bring them all together into a community like this. 
And then you push them in a frankly very intense environment. You cry together, you laugh together, you procrastinate together, you, 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 you have sleepless nights together, you wander the, the halls together. It creates the, the deepest possible bond. It's like people who've, who've fought in wars together. They, they, they have a shared experience that, that other people might not understand or, or even comprehend. And because of that, the rest of your life, you will feel connected to other MIT people. And you will want to be around them, and you will seek them out. And if you're in kind of a mixed group of people, and you hear someone from not from MIT start talking about how impossible something is, how hard something is, how difficult something is, you'll seek out the other MIT person in the room and catch a glance, and you'll both share a little smirk. <laughs> and while you're doing that smirk, if they are your preferred gender, you might see a cer certain twinkle in their eye <laughs> and realize that you are irresistibly attracted to them. So coming here, it really does feel like I, I've come, come to a family, a family that I'm deeply connected, a family that I, I truly love. And I hope to just give you some appreciation for the, the potential that, that you guys are, are about to leave with. And when I said that 14 years ago at my commencement, you know, it was kind of a, an idea on paper, but now I've seen what my peers in my class, above and below me, have done, and it's really been nothing short of, of, of amazing. And with that, I, I want to give you a sense of, of internal strength and, 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 and happiness, and not just because I care about you and I want you to be a happy person, but because I do believe that for you to really reach your potential, you really have to be centered and, and have a place to go when, when, when things get, get a little bit tough. And you should take all of this with a grain of salt. I'm not a lot older than, than most of you. I view me as your older brother or cousin or, or whatever. And, and, and what I'm about to say, these, these are things that I still try to live by, but I don't do. I'm as, at least as imperfect as any of you guys. But there are things that when I am able to do it, I have found work, work quite well. The first is, is to just be as in incredibly and maybe delusionally positive as possible. It's a very cynical place out there sometimes, and that cynicism will eat at your energy and will eat at your potential. And to fight it, you should smile with every, every atom in your body. You should smile first thing in the morning. You should even force your, this is something that I actually do. If I have a, I'm in a bad mood, I actually force a smile. It releases things in your, in your brain. You should, you should smile with your mouth, your eyes, your face, your body, at every living and non-living thing that you see. You should recognize that the grass is greener on your side of the fence. And even in the 1% chance that it's not, just convincing yourself that it's greener will be a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you find yourself in your life in an in a, in a argument with someone whom you respect, whom you care deeply about, that's a time, as well, and it's not an easy thing to do, but try to surrender your ego to, to the shared identity of the relationship that you have with that person. If possible, do the exact opposite of what your pride and ego tell you in the heat of battle. And, and if, if, if you have the strength to do it, right when, right when you're about to try to give that last word and you're about to say the kind of uh, maybe vindictive or below the belt thing, just pause, don't do anything, and try to just give them a super mega hug. <laughs> Recognize that material loss or gain, we'll all have it, but when, you, when it happens, be upset a little bit or be happy a little bit, but keep it all in perspective. They're all silly relative to your, the, the things that matter, your health and your relationships. As much as possible, try to make people feel that you're listening to them. And, and I have a secret here. The best way to make people feel that you're listening to them is to listen to them. When you're stressed, and there will be times of stress in your life, just look up at the night sky and, and imagine the, the scale of the universe, the age of the universe, the distance to the next star, the, 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 the other sentient creatures and other M-class planets who, who are also looking at, at the night sky. And think about that shared experience, the civilizations that have come and by, and it'll put your problems in, into a little bit of perspective. If you can, take a walk through the woods, forget your name, your identity, your ambitions, and just for a little bit, for a moment, Realize what you are, just another animal walking through towards another mammal, and, and, and recognize that you're, you don't, you're not quite sure why you're here, but you enjoy the ride and you love the mystery of everything that's around you and you want to explore it more. As much as possible, and this is something that's difficult and not something that I do anywhere near perfectly, but I, I try, 
is try to build true empathy for, for everyone. And a thought experiment that, that I often do to get me into that frame of mind, and it's just a thought experiment regardless of your actual spiritual beliefs, imagine that, imagine that time isn't a one-way street, that you can go back in time, et cetera, et cetera, and, and in your next life, you could be reincarnated, you could go back in time and be reincarnated as anyone. You could be, you literally, because of that, could be everybody in, in this room. And with that little mental framework in place, imagine that in your next life, you could be that person. You could go back in time and be that person that you're having the conversation with right now. Maybe that you're arguing with right now. Or maybe the person that you're passing judgment on right now. And if that is the case, then in your next life, you will have to put up with the current self-righteous version of yourself. <laughs> and so I, I want to just bring it all together with another thought experiment that, that I like to that I like to do, that, that helps me at least focus where I want to put my energies. Imagine yourself, imagine yourself in, in 50 years. You're in your, your early 70s. You're at the kind of the, the you're, you're near the end of your career, and you, you hey, yeah, well, we're very good. <laughs> we, we, have a few, we have a few models here if you have trouble visualizing that. But imagine at that stage, you're, you're on your couch, 2062, and uh, you've just finished watching the the State of the Union holograph by President Kardashian. <laughs> and you start to reflect on your life. You start to think of all of the successes you've had, career successes, family successes, the great memories that you've had. But then you also start to think about the things that you wish you had done a little bit different, your regrets. And, and, I, and I could imagine what they might be. You'll wish you spent more time with your children. You wish that you had spent, you told your spouse that you love them more frequently. You'll wish that you had spent more time and told your parents how much you appreciated them before they passed away. And just while that's happening, a genie appears. And the genie says, well, I've been listening in to your regrets. You seem like a good person. I'm willing to give you a second chance if you are open to it. And so you say, sure. And the genie snaps his fingers, and you blink your eyes. And when you open your eyes, you find yourself right there, right where you are right now, June 8th, 2012, in Killian Court, some crazy guy is giving a commencement speech. And you say, oh my god, I'm in my 20-something fit, pain-free body again. I, I, I'm around my, 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 my peers again. I, 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 this genius was serious. I have a second chance. I can have all the successes, all of the, all of the adventures that I had the first time around, but now I can optimize things. Now when I see my classmates and I give them that hug at commencement, I can hug them a little bit harder. I can show them how much I care about them. Now that I, my parents are back, I can finally tell them how much I appreciate them. I can finally give them uh, more hugs, more time. I can do everything better. I can laugh more. I can sing more. I can dance more. I can be more of a source of positivity for people around me and empower more people. And so here I am. You're, you're truly honored to, to be your, your commencement speaker, just in awe of of the potential that's here, the potential from in this time that we're in, a time when, when the revolutions, the positive revolutions, are not going to be caused by generals and politicians. They're going to be caused by innovators like you. And in this time, to see you, the wizards of tomorrow, I'm just excited by what you're going to do with your second pass. Thank you.